Hello everyone and welcome to Civic Platform. This is your host Zuhair Al Masri. Today I'm visiting immigration public consultation sessions and who will be the main speaker for this session um, Honorable John Riaz, the Minister Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration. So this session today, it's not just a normal session. Today, the minister will meet the public, especially the immigration ones who have a huge questions about their situation or their family situation. And what did the minister plan to make the immigration to Winnipeg more easier and, um, and help to find solution for all their challenges. So if you uh, today have time and you watch this episode, so uh, you will find a lot of answer for your questions. So if you have something on mind, please sit and enjoy this episode and uh, get all the benefit from the minister. Um, I will, I believe that will be a very helpful if you are facing any challenge in your immigration status. So let's find out how the minister answer the audience uh, questions. So let's jump right in. Hello, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. My name is John Reyes. I'm the Minister for Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration, and I'm also the MLA for Waverly. Tonight we had a wonderful public consultation on immigration. Uh, Manitoba wants to improve our provincial nominee program that we created back in 1998. And uh, we want to make sure that we get the feedback from the public and that's the reason why we held a public consultation here today in South Winnipeg. I've traveled the province, so this has been my 11 public consultation, but there are many needs in terms of labor and that's why we've traveled around the province. That's why we created an Immigration Advisory Council back in uh, February 14th that Premier Heather Stephenson created along uh, co-chairing with uh, the former Federal Minister uh, Lloyd Axworthy. So I'm very, very uh, delighted to have getting, gotten the feedback from a lot of people, uh, especially here in South Winnipeg tonight. And I'm looking forward to getting some work done, some meaningful work, so that we can welcome many more Manitobans to this province. So what I can tell you is last year we uh, processed just under 6,300 applications through the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. That was a record and we want to welcome more. Uh, again, uh, we are going to have a report done by the end of the year, but if there are things that we can do now to improve our immigration stream called the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program, uh, we will uh, through the recommendation of the public and through the approval of our government. So we want to make sure that uh, we hear from you and uh, I know this is the uh, third last uh, public consultation that we've had. We're going to also have engagement through our engagemb.ca website. So for those who have not applied, um, sorry, for those who have not attended a public consultation, they can actually go online, uh, which we will provide through our social media platforms to let all Manitobans, wherever they are, whether they're in Winnipeg or in Thompson or in Bolsinger, anywhere in the province, that they can have their say on how to improve and enhance the provincial nominee program. So in terms of family, because we know that a lot of people have talked about getting their families over to Manitoba because that's one of the reasons why they come here is because of family and then they would stay here in Manitoba. So one thing that we are highly considering is in terms of the criteria uh, called the adaptability factor. If they have a family connection or a, a friend's connection here, uh, we're looking at the point system. Uh, the Immigration Advisory Council has made some recommendations. So has the public and we're looking forward to those recommendations so that we can eventually streamline our provincial nominee program and improve it. So for more information, I will be having more public consultations, but all the details can be found on www.immigrantmanitoba.com. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you all for showing up tonight. I apologize for the lateness of the start. We are running a little late because there was a prayer happening. So uh, we wanted to finish the prayer first and then start uh, tonight's evening program. 
Uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, some people that are in the crowd here. So, Honorable John Gerard from River Heights is here today. John Gerard in front. And uh, it's a great honor to introduce potentially our next mayor, uh, Kevin Klein, who is running for mayor here in Winnipeg. Kevin Klein. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ibrahim Khan, or for those who most commonly know me as Abi Khan, I am the MLA in Fort White, and it gives me great honor to host uh, tonight's evening. I want to thank the Honorable John Reyes. If you didn't know, this is Honorable John Reyes. His picture is also on a four by eight in the background uh, over there. And uh, John and I did purposely wear matching jackets today so people would get us confused. <laughs> Uh, he is the Minister of Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration. Uh, and thank you, Honorable Minister, uh, for hosting the Immigration Advisory Council public meeting tonight. For those of you in attendance, and this is a great turnout tonight, thank you all for coming and we look forward to your questions and your feedback as the program goes on. I would like to acknowledge that we are First Nations people of, uh, we are on, acknowledge that the First Nations people Treaty 1 and the people of the Métis Nation, for those ancestral and homelands I speak to you today. As you may have heard on February 14th of this year, the Manitoba government announced the creation of Immigration Advisory Council, or IAC, to review the entire continuum of immigration from recruitment to retention of newcomers in Manitoba. Community consultations are happening throughout the province. I know the minister, I think you've traveled north, south, east, west, throughout this whole entire province. Uh, so thank you for that and your team. Uh, a lot of traveling and commitment has been forward, put forward by you throughout the province with the purpose to inform its recommendations on improvements and enhancement, enhancements to Manitoba's current immigration policies and program. Your contribution will support the IAC in reviewing the recommendations and implementing changes to the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program, which we are all very familiar with, and I will let the Minister speak about that more, and other aspects of Manitoba's immigration landscape. This will ensure our province continues to be viewed as a destination of choice for all newcomers to Canada. At the meeting today, there will be a brief overview of the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program, as well as stakeholder presentations, followed by a question and answer period at the very end. It now gives me great pleasure and honor uh, to pass the mic over to Minister Reyes, who will give his presentation on the MPNP program. Thank you, Emily Khan. Just want to let everyone know that I'm deeply proud to sit alongside my colleague here, the first Pakistani MLA of Manitoba and the first of Muslim uh, heritage as well. So Thank you. we should give a big hand to that because that's the Manitoba way. So when I, look, when I look in the crowd, I see the face of Manitoba has changed since I was born in 1972. Um, and I'm glad to be here in my home riding in Waverly. I want to thank the Manitoba Islamic Association for allowing us to host this very important public consultation on immigration. I've traveled the province uh, for the last uh, month and a half, two months. I believe this is my 11th public consultation. It's very important for me, for Manitobans, to know uh, what your recommendations are, what your suggestions are on ways to improve our Manitoba Provincial Nami Program, a program that the province created back in 1998, along with the government of the day. It was a pilot program back in 1997, but we've had it since 1998. I'm very proud. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, it was a PC party government that actually created that program. And you know what? Now we have a chance to improve and enhance the program that we created. And the only way we're gonna do that, in my mind, is to ask those who've actually used the program those who have immigrated here, and obviously we have a team from my Immigration Advising Council, I have some uh, panel of experts here. We have also one in the back, can you raise your hand? I know you're shy, but wait. yes. She's also uh, one of our members as well. You should have put an extra seat there, Madur, shame on you. I'm joking. So um, we have our Immigration Advising Council. I also have my panel, of my, my, my uh, department here to answer 
um, questions that are more technical. So can the department just please identify themselves to the crowd, please? Just by raising your hand. So we have, a, we have some department members here from the Immigration Pathway Division, so thank you very much. And we also have our presenters here as well that Avi will be um, um, introducing. So all I can say is that we've been getting a lot of feedback, whether I've been in Thompson, Swan River, Dauphin, Bozizer, uh, Transcona. Today we're in South Winnipeg, tomorrow I'll be in North Winnipeg, next week I'll be my, my last one in Arbor, Manitoba. And every region, corner of the province has similar needs and different needs. But here today, we are going to hear from you, uh, here in the city of Winnipeg, in South Winnipeg, to know what are your recommendations. But before we do that, I'm just going to present to you uh, what uh, my department briefed me on. It's called the MPMP 101. Just to know, just for you to know how immigrants come to Canada. So if we can proceed with that slide there, better. So how do immigrants, immigrants come to Canada? Well, as you can see, they come here through the tempor as temporary residents or the permanent residence stream. Ours is a provincial non program. Come here as a temporary worker, an actual student, and you can make your way to the provincial non program or the federal skilled worker stream. As you can see, there are a lot more federal streams as compared to the provincial streams because we're in charge of the provincial non program. When you talk about family streams, you talk about parents and grandparents, that falls under the federal streams, the federal government. When you talk about permanent residency, that falls under the federal government. We are in charge of the provincial nominee program, which we created back in 1998, which I'll go into later. Next slide, Peter. So when it comes to federal versus provincial responsibilities, as I've repeated, Manitoba's responsibilities are the FDNP Skilled Worker Program, the FDNP Business Investor Stream, and Management of Settlement and Integration Contribution Agreements. With the federal responsibilities, responsibilities you have work permits, study permits, visitor visas, permanent residency, settlement funding, and ultimately citizenship. Now in the middle, that's called the collaboration, we have a Canada-Manitoba Immigration Agreement that has not been renewed since 2003. So 19 years later, it's 2022, I think we can all agree that the needs of our province has changed. The needs of our, of our business community has changed. And we have a lot more people from different parts of the world here in our wonderful province of Manitoba. The Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program has attracted just under 300,000 300, uh, new newcomers to our province. So the next slide, in terms of immigration landings in Manitoba my class, when it comes to the immigration streams, the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program is the one obviously that dominates the stream. Now, just reading the communique, the report from the federal government, which I had a meeting with the Federal Minister of Immigration along with my colleagues from the other provinces, one thing that we did accomplish was we were able to convince the federal government to increase the allocations of provincial territorial nominee programs and providing timely multi-year allocations before March 31st, 2023. So we've actually put a date stamp there. So we've requested the federal government to have more allocations for Manitoba. Next slide. So in terms of provincial nominee landings in top Manitoba regions, we know that the bulk of the newcomers, applica applicants, come to Winnipeg. But we also know that there's a very important need of labor, uh, immigrants, newcomers for rural Manitoba. And that's why in 2020, the figure was 29.7%. As a minister responsible, I want to ensure that we also have um, um, immigrants going to our rural communities as well. We'll go on to the main pathways for MPNP for skilled workers eligibility. Skilled workers in Manitoba, you must have a valid temporary work permit, which could include a postgraduate work permit, proof of work for a Manitoba employer for at least six months, permanent long term job offer from the same Manitoba employer and you also have the Skilled Worker Overseas Program, you must demonstrate a strong connection to Manitoba through the adaptability factor, you must meet uh, settlement funding requirements, you must score at least 60 points on the points grid based on the following five factors, language skills, age, work experience, education, adaptability, the support of a family member or friend in Manitoba, prior education or experience, job offer, or an invitation to submit, 
and expression of interest through a strategic initiative. Now, one thing I do want to tell you is that uh, when we've had meetings with my Immigration Advisory Council, when I've traveled the province, having these public consultations, you know, they tell me straight up, Minister, you should consider the criteria, like reassessing the criteria when it comes to points. And yes, I did hear it. I did hear it like in, in the meetings that I had, um, and I heard from my Immigration Advisory Council members, but even as the local MLA prior to becoming a minister, when I didn't really have a lot of knowledge of the immigration streams, that points in terms of adaptability for family should be considered maybe higher because there's a stronger uh, chance of retention for that applicant, obviously if they have family here. So those are just one of the considerations, and again, I'm looking forward to your recommendations later today. So in terms of the NPNP skilled worker application process, you go on immigrantmanitoba.com, you create an online government of Manitoba single sign-on profile, and you submit that EOI, that expression of interest, and the highest scoring EOIs are drawn from pool every few weeks. You complete the uh, applications, receive full assessment, and the NPNP skilled workers submit completed permanent residence applications to IRCC, Provincial Army Lands in Canada as per resident, with full mobility rights. The business investor stream, you have three options there. The entrepreneur pathway, the farm investor pathway, the international student entrepreneur pathway. Again, I've been getting suggestions uh, from the public on ways to reconsider some of the criteria when it comes to the entrepreneur pathway, uh, the international student contour pathway. They've been giving me advice on comparing it to other jurisdictions like Saskatchewan and Alberta because we can have more investors investing in our province. Now I'm going to touch on the uh, Ukrainian situation, the IRCC measures for Ukrainians outside of Canada. So there is a pr the program, the stream called the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel, which is launched on March 17, 2022. It prioritizes visitor visa processing and response inquiries. There's no limit on numbers, and it eliminates many normal visa requirements. Uh, the same, the same can be extended up to 10 years or until the passport expires. They have a three-year open work permit, which will be issued to allow employment anywhere in Canada. Employers wishing to support Ukrainians through offers of employment can register available jobs using Job Bank's jobs or Ukraine webpage. Now, in terms of the Ukrainian temporary residence in Canada, IRCC measures for Ukrainians inside Canada, the status extension for Ukrainians currently in Canada on temporary permits. Pri prioritize the renewals of visitor work and study permits, and it waives uh, the fees. There's a waiver of fees retroactive uh, since February 22, 2022 until March 31, 2023 for temporary permits. And the administrative deferral of removals is a temporary measure that can delay a removal order that would normally require a person to leave Canada immediately. Now, with regards to NPNP for measures for Ukraines, which applies to Ukraines inside and outside of Canada, uh, prioritize processing of NPNP applications of Ukrainian citizens, prioritize processing for Ukrainian citizens wanting to submit an expression of interest and who meet the following criteria, as you can see there, and their special EOI draws, and they waive the $500 application fee. And Ukraine's coming to Manitoba under the Canada Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel Q8 could become eligible to apply to the PNP with Manitoba employment experience or other connections. And we were very proactive on this right from the beginning because we know that one in every seven Manitobans are of Ukrainian descent. So we created the Manitoba for Ukraine.ca webpage where this page helps Ukrainian nationals, whether they're here or they're outside of Manitoba or even for employers that are seeking to hire the Ukrainians as well. So everything is on that website. Next slide. And there are some of the stats uh, with regards to the NPNP. Just under 6,300 applications were made in 2021. That's a record for us. Uh, 875 NPNP allocation of nominations for skilled workers selected by federal criteria through the Federal Express Entry Program in 2021 and just under 19,000 2019 uh, immigrant arrivals, the highest uh, since MPNP created. And just uh, under 65% proportion of new immigrants arriving through the MPNP uh, from 2007 to 2021. And the retention rate has been 75%. So 
just, uh, just over. Uh, most recent from the five-year retention rate for Manitoba provincial lobbies based on uh, filed taxes that landed in 2004 to 2019. So the retention rate has actually been pretty good, but obviously we want to get those numbers higher. And uh, as you can see, uh, just under 150,000 number of new immigrants who have settled Manitoba between 2012 to 2021 for all categories, not just the PMP. And just under uh, 30,300 number of new immigrants who settled in over 130 communities outside of Winnipeg between 2010 and 2020. Uh, in my travels, I've been to Thompson, Swan River, Dauphin, and I, I can't, um, it, it just, it's just amazing to see the diversity also in rural Manitoba. Immigrants setting up businesses, immigrants hiring immigrants who come from other places from the world. Our top source countries for immigration happen to be um, India, uh, China, the Philippines, and Nigeria. So I know there was a, uh, somebody had mentioned that um, uh, that we were, uh, you know, getting immigrants from from European countries, but actually the top four countries happen to be of non-European descent. But we obviously we want to get the most qualified, whether they're where, where doesn't matter where they are from the world, but we want to make sure that they come to Manitoba and they stay in Manitoba. So that's my presentation, and I'm going to pass it on to Abby. I again want to thank you very much for attending uh, tonight on this uh, nice summer day in Winnipeg. One more thing before I, I pass the mic to Avi, because I see a gentleman in the audience. Tim Wang, Tim Wong, can you just put your hand up and you just can you stand up please? Just stand up for the audience. Alright, so they know who you are now. Tomorrow is Miracle Treat Day. Dairy Queen, if you buy a blizzard it goes to kids in hospitals, right? The funding. And the one thing I'm going to say about Tim here, I met him prior to politics. I actually owned a UPS store. He used my business. He actually used, uh, used to print business cards and flyers. Tim here uh, immigrated here as a came here as an international student in the early 2000s, and now is an owner of three Dairy Queen locations, gainfully employing 60 people, 60 medical. <laughs> and Tim here. International student, then by way of the MPNP, the Mantle Provincial Lobby Program. So here's a success story right here. So, friendly reminder go to Dairy Queen, Miracle Treat Day, buy a blizzard, treat your kids. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Minister Reyes and Tim. I will be there tomorrow. I love your the new Reese piece uh, uh, cookie dough one is out of this world. So, uh, everyone go out tomorrow to Dairy Queen. Before we move on to the QA part, I, I do want to give a special shout out to a big supporter of this community and this area. Uh, she works tirelessly in all communities, but you can always see her at the mosque. Actually, you probably see her at the mosque more than you see me at the mosque, unfortunately. Um, Councillor Janice Luke's all the way in the back there. Round of applause for Janice. <laughs> And we also have another mayoral candidate who is in the back as well, next to Janice, uh, Councillor Scott Gillingham. So we have quite the dignitaries here tonight. So if anyone has any questions for them afterwards, now is the time to get involved. Uh, there is an election coming up, so please make your way to the councillors and future mayoral candidates um, for some quality time with them. Now we'll move on to the Q&A. So the Q&A, there are a lot of people in the crowd tonight. Um, so we are going to, I'm going to ask that we please, please keep our questions to 30 seconds to a minute, okay? Um, I really don't want to stand up and interrupt you or cut you off because I want to give you a due course, but I am please asking you to keep it to 30 to 60 seconds. When you do stand up, we're gonna ask for your name, and if you're part of any organization, just so we can track that information. So your name, organization, uh, and what part of the city you live in, just so again, we can track where that question is coming from, because that is important data for us. So again, 30 seconds to one minute, please. I will ask you to limit that question to, uh, and then the minister will respond, uh, and he will have uh, one minute to three minutes maximum, even for you, minister, you get a three minute max. So, uh, without further ado, uh, we will open up. Do we have more microphones or just one microphone? 
Just one. Okay, so Maduro will, I guess, will handle it. And then um, if you do see me stand up, I won't say anything, but that is kind of time that your time is running out. So uh, we'll keep that mindful. And for now, I'll pass it over to Maduro and uh, we'll get started. And what I will do is I will make a note of those people that have their hands up and then I will ask Maduro to go around to that. Okay, so I will keep track of who has their hand up in right order and we will move accordingly. Okay, so Maduro, without further delay, if you can start off with this gentleman here and then we'll go for that. So if anyone else has a question, put your hand up and I'll... I'll um, my start. name is Ron Cantibellos, the Office Chair of the Philippine and Toronto, and I've been here since 1974. And thank you, Joe, for inviting me because you told me that no, no Filipino has attended any kind of meeting. <laughs> and I have so many questions because there are so many opaque operations and there are so many things that I would like to know. Number one, I asked the minister before, is a $500 fee for any applicant or open the wall to be void because they are not sure if they will be invited or not. It simply that a $500, according to the principles of government, to help the refugees by the federal, because the refugees are only taken care of one year by the federal and the provincial tax offer. And that's $500 in order to spend for the refugee. Okay. Is there a time that the 500 will be void for those who will not be given an invitation? Thank you, uh, Ron, and thank you for the question. Uh, back in 2017, yes, the $500 fee, application fee, was introduced back in 2017, I believe. $3.1 million uh, went towards uh, newcomer settlement support, uh, language, uh, language um, uh, programs. So uh, the one thing that I can tell you is that uh, there was no cost to the taxpayer because of that application fee. Now, if you want to compare application fees in terms of provincially, we are actually more in the middle of the row. I believe BC, uh, I don't know how much, uh, I think it's around 1500 I believe, with their fees. And the department's actually giving me a nod, it is. So we're actually in the middle of the row. So when it comes to that fee, uh, I can tell you that that fee is actually being used for uh, programs and newcomer settlement support back when it was introduced back in 2017. So, however, again, this is good that I'm hearing uh, these uh, questions and comments and uh, my Immigration Advisory Council is here as well because we're taking all recommendations and comments here at this forum and I'm looking forward to more of these questions. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, sorry, one other thing I didn't explain very well in the beginning, so as, because a lot of people have their hands up at once, so if I acknowledge you in the crowd, I have written your, uh, I've identified you somehow in here, and then I'll ask you to put your hand down. So I do have a list of about 12 people already, so if I've acknowledged you, then I will ask you the next question. The next one here is the lady in the front. Oh. Hello, my name is Wendy Kajisu, I'm one of the founding members of Akomi, I'm from Ghana. I've been in Winnipeg in Manitoba for 32 years when I came as an intern with idea. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to do this and I think it's very important and to all the presenters and their passion and what they want to do. Having been an immigrant and a leader, we could make all these policy changes. If the people at the top don't want to implement it, we will see some change, but not a big change, especially in the hiring process. You know, I think you often talk about bringing all of those secondary institutions together to ally and return the gaps, be it micro credentials or online and stuff like that. We have a lot of opportunities to streamline things, but we don't have the right people at the table. There are lots of immigrants like me who are retiring or have retired and would like to coach and mentor. We don't bring them into the room. They are sitting at home, unless somebody call you. I'm proud to see I've helped so many immigrants integrate. I've also called out unconscious or conscious biases at the workplace because I had an opportunity to sit at the table when my HR said, well, we don't have any uh, Canadian experience. And I asked them, where in the job description do we have that? They have tick, tick, tick. I challenged them. And those people that I hired are one of the best people I'm in turn. And that's where we see a lot of it. We are talking about language. The issue is not language. The issue is about integration. How do we integrate? I've been at interviews with people. And I can see 
since this person just came, he hadn't been integrated, he hadn't integrated. How do we integrate these people? So when they are interviewing, comparing with people who've been here for years, they can give examples that will align with what we are looking for. Thank you. I know we've met before. Yeah, we have. Yeah. So I believe uh, Ghana is in the World Cup, right? So I will, give, I, I will be cheering for the Black Stars, just to let you know. First of all, I just want to let you know that uh, you talk about, you're talking about a lot of things. Um, you're talking about that Canadian experience, and yes, we've heard that. I can tell you right now, you know, when you say you don't have a seat at the table, what I can tell you is that, as the minister responsible, I'm sitting at the table with all of you right now, right? And for the long term, you know, we want to ensure that we have individuals like yourself to sit at the table to help us make these decisions as a province together. We want you to become part of Team Manitoba. I can tell you since I've been the MLA for Waverly and now a minister for just over a year now in my both portfolios of economic development and jobs and now as the Minister of Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration, I'm very proud that we have more people from different communities on agencies, boards and commissions. Why? Because it's important for them not to be on the sidelines to, but to actually be at the table on those boards, on, on those commissions to help us make those decisions as a province. And before I go on, I just want to thank our presenters for the work that you do for your respective organizations. I highly respect what you do and thank you for your suggestions as well. So in terms of the, the Canadian experience and having people at the table, well, I'm telling you, this is my 11th public consultation and I really want to hear from you. And we do, uh, just to let everyone know here, we do have uh, our consulting firm here taking down notes. So everything that you are, that you are talking about in this room is being, actually being uh, taken note of. And uh, again, we have my Immigration Advisory Council here in the front. And we also have one in the far corner there because I can see him, Dr. Lana, if you can just raise your hand as well. We have another Immigration Advisory Council here as, as well. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, so thank you very much for that question. And again, I will be available after afterwards, you know, as, as long as I can be, to be one-on-one -on -one because I, I miss, I've, I've been missing these gatherings and interacting with people. Uh, it's all about grassroots and that's how we're going to get the job done here in terms of immigration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next questions will go to the blue shirt here on the left. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Abdul Batten. Uh, I live uh, like uh, four days ago. And I, uh, I lived here in this country for 22 years. And I came here as a international I and I call this country at home and I'm living here all my life in Manitoba. But recently I'm noticing like uh, the immigration policy is uh, only promoting the skill order, like who are higher right. But uh, like I have a brother like who I like to bring in here, but he has uh, a disability, but I have business. So I can bring here, but like the time I'm applying, like, he cannot be in the high rank because the, the point system lasts three, four years. It's never 1,660 or something like that. So as a immigrant, like, uh, even I applied, like, next 20 years, he cannot be in the rank. I cannot bring my brother. So instead of just doing the point system, because some people can, uh, some people have advantage over others, like for example, like some uh, Nigeria, like uh, African country, they are dual speaker, like they speak English, also the French. So they have advantage over us, uh, because they cannot get any points on the French. So I'm requesting to revise the whole system, so that like, the, like people who are waiting for a long time, and we like to bring them, and they never gonna get any chance. Because the new applicants who are applying with more uh, like advanced skills, they're gonna keep pushing them. And uh, the number of applicants you are applying, inviting for application, just 200 or something, like this is way too low. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Apu Yes. Okay, so my hearing is really good being from back here. International students, you came here through as an international student, correct? Yeah, and you mentioned about um, how the NPNP is uh, more um, more for skilled workers, because that's what it was meant to be for, 
right? It's a skilled worker entry program coming into Manitoba. It was meant to be an economic driver back in 1998, and it's meant to be that now. However, your point is well taken in terms of the points. Your point is well taken in terms of what I call a general labor category for your brother to come here, because traveling across this province, again from north, south, east, and west, there are many businesses, the hospitality industry, the service industry, who need those type of workers. And I actually did mention that to the federal minister when I did see him in St. John, New Brunswick, a week and a half ago. So as, a, as an immigration advisory council, we hear you. We uh, have heard that uh, consistently in terms of the points. We've heard that in, in terms of, you know, attracting people you know, we're attracting people that have degrees and high education, but when they come here, as my presenters did mention, my frustration has always been, prior to going into politics, if we need doctors and lawyers and engineers and nurses, nurses, why are they not working the jobs that they should be working at, right? For credential recognition. And that was one of the last meetings we had. And I think, um, uh, Monica, Monica, you had mentioned about preparing them before they come here. I know one of my Immigration Advising Council members talked about pre-arrival checks, because I could never understand, you know what, if an immigrant's coming here, why aren't they prepared back home so when they come here, that they're streamlined and gainfully employed right away, correct? So, so I bet there's been those challenges. I, myself, being from the Filipino community, have seen many of my community members working in jobs that they should not be working in, right? We need those type of jobs, though. Don't get me wrong, because we have a labor shortage. But thanks again for your input. Point well taken. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Minister Reyes. Uh, now we will move to the lady in the front row here to the right. My name is Adilola. I live at the south end of the city. Representing NAMI, the Nigerian Association of in Manitoba. I'm glad you mentioned something, and that was the fact that why do we have doctors and project managers? And you know, they came in, they did the professional exams, but they're still not working. They're not giving them opportunity to do that. But you find out that these same people get employed in the UK. They go out of Canada after taking all the courses here in Canada. They get employed in the UK. They're doing well in the UK. Why is that happening? Why did you bring them all the way here? Sit for the exams, pass, no job. It's very frustrating. Secondly, I would like to suggest for people who have families here in Manitoba and they spent more than five years. There could be an additional point for them for when they are sponsoring someone or when maybe a family member is coming, they can have extra points because they've been, they've been here and they've established themselves here. So those are the points. I uh, just want to let you know, yes, we've heard, we've heard uh, uh, comments about foreign parental recognition. Uh, we, that's part of our mandate. One of it is, is to enhance Manitoba Settlement, Integration, and Foregrantial Recognition Program services for all newcomers to Manitoba in order to encourage labor market attachment, improve foreign qualification recognition, and bolster immigration ret immigrant retention. So that's actually part of our mandate, just to let you know. So we are working on that. Uh, the other thing that you, you, you pointed out, again, we've heard again, is the, in terms of additional points, the adaptability factor in terms of family, because right now I believe it's uh, I'm looking at my department, 200 points. It's 200 points. And even some of the, those who uh, apply through the PNP is 200 points, but we have heard that uh, that should be uh, considered uh, in terms of perhaps reevaluating the criteria. So thank you. Okay, next we will move to uh, behind you. I'll put your name down as well, but in the purple shirt at the beard. Uh, so my question is uh, more sort of, uh, because I sponsored my wife.
So I guess uh, apparently we did turn the air conditioner on and it's a very loud air conditioner so we'll ask everyone to speak up. Uh, I didn't know it was that loud, sorry. <laughs> and again, thank you uh, Salman, you can believe Salman in the back there. I'm just joking Salman, he's a good friend of mine. So Mohammed, uh, back to your question, uh, you're talking about uh, your spouse coming here. Now, um, your sp I just want to, is, it, is she here now or is she still in Pakistan? It's still in the process. Okay, and, and you applied through the IRCC? Okay, so just to let you know again, in my presentation, I don't know if you were here, IRCC falls under the federal stream, right? And I thought he would be here today, uh, our local member of parliament, Terry Dugan. So I, 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 would just, uh, I would just suggest you contact the, your local member of parliament. Fort Gary, I believe is, I think it maybe it's Jim Carr, I believe. So I, I, so I recommend you contact your local member of parliament. We do have some technical staff here as well. I can answer those fundamental questions, but more in detail, you're gonna to have to deal with the IRCC, all right? Uh, we'll go to the lady in the front row here. From what I understand though, refugees, there is a one year commitment from the federal government to support those refugees, right? But talking with uh, local MLA, uh, uh, John, Honorable John Gerard here, we've talked about having a meeting because there are some gaps perhaps that the province can uh, support after that one year, right? Now, I need more clarification on what the federal government does cover because I know that after that one year, that obviously we want Afghans to stay in Manitoba, right? Because we, I have heard anecdotally that Afghans have left for other provinces, right? And I know there's Afghans that have skills as well coming to our province. So but thank you very much for that, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting with the Afghan community. So um, I, I do know a lot of people still have their hands up. I have brought another 20 people here, so I am trying to make my way through as we can, but I, I am writing down people as I saw their hands go up. So. I have acknowledged you, I have seen you, but you are way, you are down the list. So for now, it is uh, the blue shirt all the way in the back. Yeah, hi. My name is Irfan Manda. I live in South Point. So my question to the minister is, I have been watching the Manitoba MPLP job for a long time. And uh, uh, my concern is that the skilled worker overseas program, you, there has been no job for a long time. The draws that have been happening are uh, for the people who have been invited directly by the NPNP under a strategic recruitment initiative. So what, when is the skilled overseas program draws going to happen? Thank you, Edda. Uh, thank you, um, Irfan Dula. And um, I think that's more of a technical question that I'll, I'll, I'll actually mentor go back to Vijay Sharma back there, who's actually part of my department. So I'll just repeat what Mr. Ria said. He said that's more of a technical answer, so he'll pass it to uh, Vijay in the back there to maybe answer that question. Or Natalia. Or Natalia. Hi. Um, so, yes, in the past, I think there are lots of tests the skilled worker overseas draw was lost. It was uh, in July, sorry, June 
or July of 2021, we are looking, uh, we are kind of in a rare economic program, right? So we're focusing on uh, those, so basically at this point we have been drawing uh, in a, in new farmers, candidates who have been working in Manitoba, who have been drawing international students, and those that have been invited through the employer direct stream. So the employers, so we work with employers and they identify that their skill is needed, they have bought a job offer, and they have a And also due to the COVID restrictions, uh, there are a lot of you know, processing times have, been slowed down, have slowed down, as well as you know, travel restrictions were in place too. So our focus was let's invite you know, and let's kind of, you know, assess applications of those applicants who are currently in the already, so they can continue to contribute to the labor market and address the, the shortages. Um, so in, as, as we're kind of recovering from the pandemic, so we will you know, re look at the priorities and we'll look at our costs. Hi, John. Hi, team. Uh, I live in the River Lakes and I want to work at National Company South for Software. And I've been here in the home like uh, 2090. And I love the system I love about here and the NB. I came here from the system. A micro system is around the past person. But yeah, we know that we are looking into uh, right now in inland applicants. But is there a day or something around? Because we know that the board is being open now. Uh, I have been assigned to walk office now. I was working since my like, pandemic from home. And I stayed here. I, I got all the office from all the way to provinces, but I'm still in Manitoba because of the system. I love that and it is reuniting the families. Mm -hmm. So my just the question is related to the family stream, which is still overseas. If you have any plans about it, just share with us and we are good. Yep. Yeah, and you know what? I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say again. You know what? That's been mentioned three times already today, and consistently when I've traveled, that that is going that is going to be uh, considered. Like with the the adaptability factor from my immigration advisory council and from the feedback of the public. So yes, uh, we are looking at uh, all options and recommendations. Question will be the gray shirt here. This gentleman walked in with me. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm from I have three questions uh, for you. It's very fast. First of all, uh, after graduation, it's expected for established students to uh, find a relevant job to their studies instantly to apply for PIP or uh, find uh, any job uh, made for six months in the programs. Uh, there are just two options for established students right now. Uh, is it possible for you to alter that? Uh, because uh, waiting for the post graduation or permit, etc., it takes uh, a little bit time, uh, six days to 180 days. So, uh, most of the international students end up with uh, worker jobs to apply the IP. And second, my second question is uh, about the six months period. This six month period of uh, the work experience is expected to be uh, uninterrupted. Uh, is there any way to just uh, alter or change that? And my last question, sorry about that. Uh, are you able to just add supplements for the international students who do uh, long term work here in the world? So, I don't know if that's just uh, working without uh, having any. So Adam, you had three questions there. And I'm going to be honest with you. Let's talk afterwards with one of my members of my team, all right? All right, that was that was a good answer, John, Minister Reyes. So anyone to ask three questions or more, and he'll give you some private time afterwards. So, uh, okay, now we will move along to uh, the green shirt in the center left over here, the gentleman with the hat on. Yes. The question I have is for those of us that are really big guys and. Most of the time when we are doing the ranking, uh, there are points that are given to people outside Winnipeg. And for those of us that have relatives who are skilled workers, and we are in Winnipeg, I came to Winnipeg through this program, Manitoba Nomi. Thank you to Manitoba Government for that. And I landed in Winnipeg, and I've been here for 12 years. If I want to bring my friends, families who are doctors, who are engineers, and being told that 
somebody outside Winnipeg at one point at me, I can't leave Winnipeg to Thompson because I want to invite somebody. I'm here, I'm a Winnipegger. So on behalf of the Winnipeggers, I want the government to look into that area. You can't, because we are living in Winnipeg, give points to people outside Winnipeg more than us. And I want to tell you, most of the resources of Manitoba is generated from Winnipeg. We are the highest tax payer. We have the highest population. Why do you want to this transfer for us for living in Winnipeg? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. My question to you is what, what do I tell the people in Thompson? What do I tell the people in Swan River that need labor, that need doctors, who give me suggestions? You know, Minister, you should consider our region at more points. But you know what? Those are good suggestions that you're bringing because, yeah, we do need a lot of internationally educated professionals, not like all over Manitoba. As the minister responsible, I've told you in my presentation, I want to see our numbers grow outside of Winnipeg because it's needed and I've traveled and I've heard them. But yes, we need doctors also in the capital region, I understand that. So point well taken, but I'm just letting you know what the feedback that I've heard in other public consultations. Uh, but again, uh, we're going to consider everything that everyone brings up here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Now we'll move uh, to this gentleman here in the uh, front row with the blue shirt and the beard. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sal, and I live in Kildonan area. I've been in Winnipeg for over two years now. My question is, uh, I want to hear like, your opinion about, uh, for instance, MPMP uh, is choosing applicants based on their experience, language, um, uh, family living in Manitoba, and that's how you get chosen. Um, but unlike when you apply and you get the nomination, it goes to federal, and at the federal, you get chosen randomly, which is, in my opinion, doesn't really, it's not, fair to get uh, nominated pretty quickly because you're good, because everything that made you eligible, you met. But when it goes to federal, you have to wait. For instance, people that applied maybe 2020, they are still waiting to happen to now. Unlike people who applied just like a month or two months ago, they might get chosen. The fact that applicants are chosen uh, randomly at the federal level. So I just want to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean, and thank you for driving all the way here uh, to uh, South Winnipeg. So, my opinion on, first of all, on, in terms of NPNP and the adaptability factor when you're applying, um, those are things that we're, we're going to have to look at to reconsider so we can streamline things. Um, I've heard from many that the program has been very successful, but like all programs, we can improve and enhance programs that we've created. And that's the reason why we're here. Uh, speaking about when the transition goes to the federal IRCC, I really cannot speak to that, but what I can do is communicate that with my, with my federal counterpart, the federal minister. You could also bring it up with your local MP, and I believe your local MP is probably uh, Bill Blakey, I believe, up in, up in your area. So that's basically what I would call my, my former military, the chain of command, is talk to your local uh, member of Parliament to uh, address that issue in terms of the randomness of how they do their their processes uh, because that's a process that I don't control but I can definitely communicate that and as as the provincial minister I did communicate some of the issues in terms of the backlogs of permanent residence uh, applications uh, from, from, from Manitoba. We'll go all the way to the back right and the blue hat Assalamu hello John, how are you? Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Bamba and uh, I'm living in Fort Richmond. I just moved here in December, uh, seven months before. And uh, my question to you is, like many people come from other provinces to Manitoba. And uh, just to see MPNP and also PR. Uh, and at the end, they move back to their provinces. So my question to you is, is there any way like we're tapping that or maybe discouraging that? So that won't happen in the future because it affects uh, people and being, people are discouraged for choosing Manitoba to live and staying here. So uh, that's my question. The second question is, uh, 
in uh, International Student Pathway Program, uh, there's mentioned that uh, only masters and PhD students can apply for that uh, International Student Pathway. Is that correct or wrong? No? Because I would like to ask why aren't uh, people doing that to the postgraduates, why aren't they doing that as well? Because uh, obviously it's going to benefit Manitoba in the long run if uh, people choose Manitoba as a destination for study. So, uh, how would you like to respond to that? I was actually in Saskatchewan uh, last month where I took a cab to, uh, you know, to, uh, to a location. And um, one of the members of my team asked the cab driver, are you an international student? Uh, yeah, I was, but I'm here in Saskatchewan for PR and I'm gonna move back to BC. That's a common story, unfortunately. Um, the one thing that I can tell you is that, um, you know, under the, uh, the charter rights mobility, once you get that PR, they're free to roam wherever they want to. Is there anything that I, that I could do about it as a provincial minister? I cannot. But this is something that, you know, because this, this has been etched in stone that, you know, the reason why we live in Canada is that we're free, right? The true north strong and free. Um, something maybe that, again, uh, the charter rights is, 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 is the government of Canada, right? Uh, so that's a difficult one, but that'll happen. What I can tell you though is 75% of those who have applied for PNP have actually stayed in Manitoba uh, based on our, our, our latest stats from 2014 to 2019. So it's a very, very um, positive. So right now we'll go to the middle here uh, with a gentleman in blue and white shirt and then I'm going to make my way over to you in the white shirt. I know you've had your hand up the whole time. You will be next. Hi, good evening, uh, Jeff. Uh, my question is, first of all, my name is Jukes and I live on South Frontier. Uh, my question is, uh, what? I noticed one thing about international students when they graduate from here, they are still expected to take the English language test. Of what use is it to them taking the English language test? That's why the fact they study here in Canada. I would like to know this. Yeah, you know what the thing is, there, 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 there are language tests that you have to apply, for, like you have to do to, in order to immigrate to any of our streams. However, however, okay, again, this is, more, this is a very technical question that I'd like to, uh, Natalia or, or VJ, could you please answer more technically? Maybe afterwards, or you want you can do it now if you want. Okay, so after 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 our formal Q and A, choose. Let's go together with uh, the department there, and so we can uh, find out the technicalities, all right? Okay. Uh, next, we'll go uh, to the gentleman in the white shirt over here. Yes. My name is Abdullah Yu. I live here in South Point. I was part of that investment in PMP program. Five years back. I have already asked my concern about the unfair way to evaluate my business case. And I'm still following up with your office and your response. For a reason or another, there was unfair treatment from the assigned officer to my case. Not from the beginning, it's towards the end of my evaluation. This is one thing. The second thing, I'm going to re-address the person that we are proud of, which is a visual person the attention of the people here. And um, is there a way to improve that? Yes, definitely a fair treatment for these new immigrants. Thank you, Abdullah, for that question. You know, the business investment stream definitely want to um, grow that program. And I've heard a lot of concerns from many people uh, who have used that program. The frustration is, uh, from what I hear from those applicants, is that they come here through the business investor program. They're waiting for their PR. The employees, they're hired. They hire, get their PR before they do. And they're still paying their children, like we do the business investor applicant, that international student fee, which is a lot higher than their staff, right? So there's a gap there. There's something wrong there, right? So in terms of your individual case, so uh, Abdul, Abdullah, sorry. Uh, let's bring this up with uh, my team uh, afterwards, all right? Yeah. 
Okay, so we are uh, running uh, close out of time here. We're going to limit it to three more questions. Sorry, I know I have another eight people down here, but there's just not enough time. So what I recommend, if you're not one of the next three people, then maybe you can grab uh, Minister Reyes, sorry, or, or we, can, we can go to one of the councils as well. So uh, right now we'll go to this gentleman here in the front row who's had his hand up the whole entire time. Hey, my name is George. I'm a founding president of the Refugee Community Organization in Manitoba and past president of CMC in Manitoba. Uh, I'd like to talk about things that very sad that discuss the business stream or, or the entrepreneur stream and employee of the right. If we look at other programs like Saskatchewan, the language for English is not a must. It's helping from the point, but it's not the most. So we should be able to, and the second thing I want to point out is, in BC and in Ontario, they are English requirement, even they have that. You don't need to, when you apply for your work permit, when, when you approve for that, you still can come here, set up a business, while in Canada you can learn the English language skill, so you can pass the language. Of course, we like to see the language uh, drop from 5 to 4 or 3.5 because some persons might even know they can speak English, they can hire those international students with your language skill so create jobs for our uh, like a, in province, like a workers. And the second thing is also I like to talk about this employer direct. When you look at the employer direct, most of them are fairly big corporations. We have a lot of small and medium sized businesses. I would need people. For example, the Chinese folks and dim sum. Yes, they might need a dim sum. Like a chef who cannot speak English properly, but these are the one who is a cornerstone of economic development. Thank you. Yeah, point well taken there, uh, George. You know, I've seen that many, many, many years ago. People would bring, uh, you know, general labor, even though their language skills were not of the level, but then they learn the lingo, obviously they learn they're, they're English on the job and, and uh, you know, their language skills would improve. What I can tell you in terms of the business investor uh, stream uh, with language and comparing to Saskatchewan, we are looking at other jurisdictions to compare uh, because we want to improve uh, that uh, stream uh, in terms of MPP. Uh, with regards to uh, your other question, I believe was um, the employer direct uh, aspect of things. Uh, this is where we have to take a whole government approach uh, with, in terms of my portfolio's immigration and the Minister for Economic Development, Investment and Trade, where we have to communicate and, and figure out that process if there's an employer that has a need for certain um, occupations, then we have to communicate that through, through immigration so that we can uh, advertise that, look for that, help, help yourself as an applicant find those uh, type of individuals. Uh, but that's actually um, being worked on. Uh, I've been listening to those comments and suggestions from my, from my staff, but uh, thank you very much for the, uh, that question. So I feel like there's a lot of misinformation amongst the international students because we don't seem to have the right information or know where to go as regards the information around the NPAP. So I feel like there should be some form of support for international students and um, some form of way of getting feedback really. Because for me, for instance, I'm doing a one-year program, so there's a lot of pressure to get the NPMP process started. I have um, some information about the career pathway for international students. And one thing I've heard is that um, even if you've applied for your postgraduate work permit, and the postgraduate work permit hasn't come back, then you cannot apply for the, um, for the NPMP immediately which I find a bit, you know, because the government, the, the federal government has allowed me to start work. Mm -hmm. So that should serve for something, and it doesn't. So I feel like there's some, um, you know, maybe misinformation or a gap somewhere, and that should be addressed, because we're under pressure. We want to get it done as quickly as possible so that we don't get out of status. That's the one thing. Um, and I feel like we should know where to go to to support. Right? You're stating uh, something that uh, there's a gap in, in your in your uh, opinion in terms of international students uh, with regards to connecting with them being and knowing all the details on how to best go uh, through the immigration stream uh, so that you can 
uh, stay here as well. So we have we have our technical staff here, so I encourage you to stay because they're going to be here to answer those questions, right? Hi, this is Mohammed Diaz. I have basically a request and it reduces the points for the language requirement for communication and increase the points for the family connection. Because our is not helping, the whole Airbnb is not helping the local resident to bring their family to the Manitoba. Because once you award, award 500 points to the international student or other category and take a limited number of seats in a club, even if you want to bring our family in our single skill migrant category, honestly, we can't. Like, I'm just giving example, I would like to just look at this example. I want to bring my brother who's working as a software engineer in England, running a hospital for eight years. But I cannot. The thing is that to get him to him, our head, although he, used to have, he has done two master's degree, but it's hard for him to get the 8.5 or 8 band at night to get on top of the drop. Yes, we can get him into the drop, but it's hard, it's almost impossible for our family members to get jump out of the drop once you already awarded five extra points for other categories. Like we are in this many program, we choose many program, many families just to choose many program just to bring their family. And now it's almost impossible. I as a minister, my immigration advisory council members uh, want to, you know, help as many Manitobans as we can to bring in their families here through our provincial nominee program. I must let you know though that, you know, we only have that one, two streams in terms of provincially and you're talking about the points. We've heard this already, right? We've heard about the points, you know, reconsider the points. We've heard about family. There are a lot of federal streams as well that fall under the family stream, so that's their, that's their actually stream. Ours is more that skilled worker. I hear you loud and clear, your, your, your brother is a software engineer, and that's why we're doing these public consultations. That's why I as a, I as a minister am here, right? That's why my department's here. That's why my Immigration Advisory Council's here. That's why Premier Stephenson created this back in February 14th, because we want to improve and streamline uh, immigration in Manitoba, because we have a labor shortage. So I just want to leave you with that, and then we don't afterwards, because we can talk forever here, but I'll be after this. I, I don't mind talking with you afterwards and with my staff, all right? Thank you very much for uh, watching the Immigration Public Consultation here in South Winnipeg at the Waverley Grand Mosque, here in my riding of Waverley. As the Minister for Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration, I welcome all your feedback and recommendations. Just go to our website again at www.immigrantmanitoba.com. Thank you. We reach the end of our episode. Thank you for watching and thank you for Honorable John Riaz, the Minister Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration for this very helpful session. So if you like the episode, please like, share and subscribe to see our upcoming episode.